Hi guys, I'm Cheryl. Nice meeting everybody. Thanks for joining our workshop. Um, I'm one of the Pediatric Emergency Medicine Fellows um, and it's super exciting to see everybody with such very teaching experience in this workshop. Um, and I'm excited to facilitate it with Dr. Mike Mischer um, and then Dr. Um, Richard Wiggins is gonna help to moderate. Um, Mike and Rick, do you guys wanna give a brief introduction as well? Uh, sure. Hello, everyone. My name is Mike Mischer. I'm one of the faculty in the Division of Pediatric Emergency Medicine, and I'm here today to help facilitate along with Dr. Yang. Hi, I'm Rick Wiggins. I'm a radiologist here at the U, and uh, for this session, I am the AV technical support. Uh, so I will be helping to monitor the chat room and help things in the background for Dr. Meisters and Yang. And if you have any help with anything, you could just DM me in the chat, uh, send me a direct message in the chat and I'll try to help you with anything. And I'll be monitoring the chat room and posting links and sending you to and from break rooms. All right, awesome. Thanks guys. Okay, so let's get started. So I, you know, based on that introduction, I recognize that so many of you may be already familiar with active learning already, um, or may have had experience using active learning strategies. Um, and I would just love to know where everybody's comfort level is with this topic. Um, so it's on the same website. If you go to menti.com and use this code, uh, 11601676, um, and there should be a dot on your screen. Go ahead, place your dot where you think you are with active learning. So either you're brand new to it or you're like super experienced and you've used it a lot in your teaching. Um, I would just love to know where everybody is. Perfect. And Mike and Rick, hopefully everyone has just seen my mentee slide. Is that correct? Not everything else on my screen. Great. <laughs> All right, awesome. Cool. So this is great. So based on this, it is obvious that there's a lot of collective teaching experience here. Um, this is meant to be super informal. And as we go through the workshop, if you have questions or if, um, if you wanna just share what's worked for you, what challenges you've had, um, and I'm just excited to learn from everybody. So let's get started. So quick thought experiment. Oops, thought experiment too early. Quick thought experiment. So you're asked to give a talk on Zoom and you're super excited, you love this topic, and you spend like hours and days and working on this PowerPoint, and you find like the coolest memes, the best jokes, and you're give, you give your talk, and this is what happens. And I do recognize the irony of using this meme to demonstrate this point. Um, and I know personally for me, since I started doing more teaching on Zoom, this feeling of like, is anyone even paying attention to this has definitely happened uh, very frequently. So what is student engagement? Um, and I really like this graph, this diagram. And Dr. Elizabeth Barkley describes it as the product of motivation and active learning. Um, and in my previous job, I was a middle school teacher. So I focused a lot on motivation. And what I found was that by using active learning to engage my students also improved their motivation. Um, so it's very much a synergistic relationship. And over time, I think I've really grown to thinking beyond just like, how do I entertain my students? Not that I don't want them to have fun, um, but especially now that I'm working primarily with adult learners, um, I, I've been thinking more like, how do I engage my students to achieve the highest learning outcomes? So I'm excited to talk about that today. So by the end of this workshop, we hope that you can describe the importance of active learning compare different strategies, and also be able to incorporate it into your teaching sessions. Um, we did get a little bit meta writing the objectives, and we do have a disclaimer to our workshop, um, which is why our objectives are not all the way at the tippy top of this Bloom's taxonomy pyramid, um, which is that it's just an introduction to active learning. Um, however, we do hope that this can provide everybody with some strategies that you can immediately apply to your learning. So let's go through the first objective. So what is active learning? So active learning is an instructional method that engages students in the learning process and learners can participate in meaningful learning activities and also 
um, think about the things that they're doing. And this is in contrast to traditional lectures where they're passively receiving information from the instructor. And this is by no means to say that lectures are inherently bad or there's no role for lectures. And I think most of us can probably remember a teacher who was a really good lecturer or you yourself might be a really great lecturer. Um, what this means is that lecturing alone may not be the most effective format for your teaching session. So why does this matter? So it matters for three reasons. Um, active learning helps improve knowledge retention. Um, so as you all know, we all have, I think even now in the digital multimedia age, lower attention spans and especially over Zoom, our attention spans are probably even shorter. And typically people say adult learner attention span decreases after about 15 to 20 minutes. Um, so a traditional lecture is probably less effective after this period. Um, traditional lectures also target basic levels of learning, which includes memorization of facts. And you guys can probably gather now that educators like pyramids. So there's all different types of pyramid. And on the left side, you have the Bloom's Taxonomy Pyramid. And there's lower levels of learning, like just remembering, understanding, and there's higher levels of learning, like analyzing, evaluating, creating, and that's what we try to aim for as educators. Um, and active learning helps to facilitate really more the application of knowledge and tries to aim for those higher levels of, levels of learning and like analyzing, evaluating, and creating. Um, and lastly, active learning encourages self-directed learning. And it sort of goes back to my previous point. Um, and, you know, I know adult learning theory postulates that, you know, adults are more self-motivated learners. They have internal, you know, internal kind of motivators as opposed to children needs more extrinsic. Um, but it turns out there is a synergistic relationship between motivation and active learning. And that by being more engaged in the learning process, learners also tend to seek out opportunities and learn independently. Any questions about any of this so far? And I know many of you earlier on that curve, it seems like most of you guys have some familiarity with active learning. Okay, awesome. So this now brings us to the bulk of our workshop, um, which is where we will explore a few active learning strategies. Um, and you guys will be doing that in small groups. So there are many types of active learning techniques. Um, and this diagram sort of shows you a spectrum of them. Some are simpler and don't require as much preparation. And some are just much more complex and require a lot of pre-planning. But it doesn't mean that the simple strategies are not effective. And I think a lot of these simple strategies can also be very effective, even teaching really large groups. Um, and all of these techniques can be adapted for virtual learning as well. So in your small groups today, um, we would also like you guys to think a little bit now that we're doing more Zoom teaching, you know, how do we incorporate some of these active learning strategies and use them over Zoom as well? So in the next part of this workshop, um, we're gonna be dividing you guys into groups. So I think since there's about probably 23, 22 folks, we can have maybe four per group, um, Mike and Rick. Um, and you guys will be tasked with learning about one to two active learning strategies. Um, and there will be a Jamboard slide that we'll have you guys fill out. Um, and then we'll all come back as a group and your group will be presenting and teaching your active learning strategies to everybody else. And we'll have a discussion about some of these strategies. Um, so let me just demonstrate what you'll be doing in your group. Um, and I am going to share right now. <clears throat> uh, I'm gonna just, I'm gonna put in the chat five different handouts. Um, and you don't have to open up all of the handouts yet until we assign a group number um, so you know which group you'll be in. But there are five different groups and you'll be going into the breakout rooms. And so for example, if you're in group one, and I'm gonna stop sharing this screen for a second so you guys can see. Um, 
what the handout's going to look like. So for example, if you're in group one, you're going to be responsible for learning about pause procedures and think pair share. Um, and then go ahead, assign one person to fill out the Jamboard slide. And I'll show you guys in a minute what that looks like. And one person as the a group spokesperson so that when we all come back as a big group, that person can kind of present and teach these strategies to everybody else. Um, and then there will be a Jamboard slide that you'll find out, you'll fill out. And these are some resources to learn more about your active learning strategies. Um, and then I know a lot, a lot of you guys probably have resources that you like as well. So feel free to use like additional, you know, active learning websites or books that you have to also help you with the slides if there are resources that you like better. So this is what a Jamboard slide is gonna look like. Um, Mike and Rick, are you able to see the Jamboard slide? Perfect. So um, your group will be filling out one of these slides. And the key things that I want you guys to discuss and also be able to present to the big group is, what is this active learning strategy? Provide an example. Um, what are the pros of using it? What are some cons? And then like, if you were to do it over Zoom, how would you implement this strategy? Um, it is a fairly limited space, but feel free to add slide if you guys wanna add a slide. Um, so for group one, there are two slides, but you can definitely add more. Um, and then you can also type um, using some of these things. If you're feeling very fancy, if there's an image that really speaks to you, feel free to add it as well. Um, and then I also oh, recognize that some of these might be hard to write out like a full example. Um, so go ahead, you can bullet point it and just, you know, as long as you can kind of describe what an example of like a pause procedure is to the group, um, that's kind of what we're looking for. But, you know, don't feel like you have to write a whole paragraph for each of these. Any questions about the activity? I think someone, oh, yep, go ahead. We, we couldn't see the Jamboard slide you were showing us oh sorry about that let me let me stop share and then this is what a jamboard slide should look like and more than one person can write in it but i just i, I figure it's probably easiest to have one person but you guys can kind of divvy up you know the different tasks so there that's the template that's already there but feel free to move it around so for group one you have two different strategies and you can text you can add image. I think the sticky note shows up too. You can draw pictures. Um, and then you can also add a slide if you guys want to you know, add an additional frame to this. Any questions about the small group activity before Rick reads out what group you're in? Let's see if I see any other hand up. Okay. Awesome. We'll give you guys about 10 minutes. And if there, if you guys need more time, um, we'll try to give you guys more time. And you'll see Mike and I probably just popping in and out of the groups. Just feel free to ignore us. <laughs> but we're there if you have questions about the logistics or if you have questions about the strategies, um, we're just there to help. But we'll probably just kind of be in the background. Hello, everybody. Welcome back. I think that's pretty much everybody. Um, I heard some awesome discussions. It was really cool to listen in on what you guys were talking about and kind of the challenges that I also very much connect to um, in terms of thinking about how to engage learners over Zoom. So we'll just go, um, I, will, I can share all the Jamboard um, slides. And if you guys wanna just go from, we'll start with group one and sort of share your strategies and I think each group, we can give you about four minutes um, to kind of talk about um, your strategy. So group one, I am gonna share your slide. Do you guys wanna talk to, do you guys, do you guys wanna present your strategies um, real quick to the group? Sure, I'm, I'm the representative. Hi everyone, I'm Jess Tidswell. I teach in athletic training and I was joined by Allison, um, Mackey, I didn't ask how to pronounce your last name. Oh, I got it right. Awesome. By the fabulous Allison Mackey and Natalie Allen. And we had some wonderful conversation and um, just enjoyed this very, very much. So we had pause procedures, which uh, in looking into that is sort of known as a, a one minute 
paper uh, or reflection, typically used at the end of the class period, but can also be used at the beginning. So where you can teach your concept and then come to the, the ending and instead of saying, okay, today we reviewed blah, 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 um, any questions? And the, the depending on how long your lecture or class periods are, mine are two hours and 15 minutes uh, every day and have the students all just look at you like enough already, I gotta go and get out of here. Um, you can actually give them, um, say, hey, like take a minute and let's write a paper or even we had the idea of word clouds or even drawings, um, they can write some things or take time to reflect, which also gives the, you know, introduces becoming a reflective person and reflective practitioner, which all of us know can be very helpful. Pros would be it's great at the end of the class to determine the student's understanding of the concepts or perhaps where they have questions, but however, they can also give them an opportunity to take a minute and tell you how much they didn't like the lecture or don't like the concepts or it's too hard or they didn't like having to touch their um, partner's uh, stinky feet or what have you. So that might be an issue there. Also, I've used this in classes I've taken before and I get one or three sentences done because I have to write perfect writing. So I'm not so good at this one uh, in my own world. Vis virtual considerations, because we know a lot of folks are still using Zoom or virtual platforms are we could use the Jamboard. I'd actually never seen that before or some type of Google environment where people can share all at once and they can see each other's work. Um, and like we said, the word cloud, if you're in the classroom environment Environment or just you can use the whiteboard and everyone can type and just share their words that they're coming up with or phrases, which we thought that was kind of a fun idea. Or pictures, if anyone can draw. I know mine are all stick figures and I'm not the best artist, so uh, that doesn't work so well for me. Uh, we had two topics. I'm not sure if everyone did, but our next one was actually called Think, Pair, Share. And this is used quite often in, um, if you take any uh, courses, especially I would highly recommend them from the CTLE. Sorry, I had to put a plug in, but um, think pair share is something where you can take your students and maybe a concept you're working on or idea and say, let's get together and let's everybody just have a think about what we're doing. Um, whatever your concept is. I taught range of motion today and goniometry. So how do we think we're gonna set up this goniometer to measure knee flexion range of motion? They think about it for a second and then they get together it with their partner or a small group and they talk about how they're gonna set this up and then they share it there with their group or their pair with either the class, if you have a small enough class or with another group. Because if you have a larger group of like 60 or hundred, by the time you get them all up in the front, if you're anything like me, you're going to run out of time. And then some groups who have great ideas, it's not going to be shared. So this is great because you can help empower the students and show that their ideas are very valued and helps with the critical thinking. And you can communicate all these different ideas. Um, cons can be sometimes people like me talk too much and we got to like get get me to be quiet uh, since we only have four minutes here. And then um, you can record this on your Zoom, use some slides or some type of virtual uh, sharing document like uh, Google, some type of Google Drive or Google Note type thing. Those were our ideas. Hopefully Thanks, that's Jess. what you wanted. That was great. Okay. Now you, you guys summarized group. the two strategies so well. Um, does anyone have any questions about these two or have had experiences or challenges using them? The one thing I will say about um, one minute at the pause procedure, I recently had a conversation with a colleague that was trying to you know, develop their curriculum and they talked about incorporating an exit slip at the end of a class, which in essence is a pause procedure and I actually used to use those in my middle school class. And it's really a formative assessment. You know, we always think about assessments like it's got this, you know, this big long quiz or this whole thing, but it's really great just to have one question at the end of your class. And it can really help you to figure out like, oh, are my students still really confused about this one topic? And it seems like a lot of people are and something that you can use to address, you know, in your next classroom. So there's a lot of different words you'll hear that are all pause procedures. So like exit slips, muddiest um, point, you know, one minute paper, all those are considered pause procedures. Perfect. So next group we have, 
Um, thank you, group one. Next one, we have case-based learning and then problem-based learning. So group two, I'll have you guys share with the group. Is there somebody in group two that can share what they came up with? Just kind of share with the big group what you discussed. I can do that. We didn't, oh, sorry, we didn't um, identify a speaker. Um, so we had case-based learning and problem-based learning. Um, essentially, we tried to like really synopsize the definition of case-based learning too. And I think this is something most of us in healthcare are familiar with, um, presenting a case and then discussing it oftentimes by with directed questions about that case. Um, uh, and um, so an example, showing a CT scan, um, asking a trainee to describe the case, synthesize the information that's, you know, that's, that they're seeing on the CT, um, providing a differential diagnosis, and then some facts about that diagnosis. Um, yeah, so similar idea, we use these cases, I think, in the hospital environment and clinic environments, as well as our didactic environments. Um, so pros that we identified, it really does allow for like that big picture integration thinking. Um, you know, we oftentimes in classes are teaching these things in disparate ways, and yet we're forcing the student to take all this information and integrate it. Um, and it really does, I think students are really engaged and motivated when we do case-based learning because it feels like practice. Um, it feels like what they're actually training to do. Um, the cons, the cons that we identified is it's, and I think this could be a pro or a con depending on how it's used, um, is the zebra cases. You know, it seems like we oftentimes will have these cases of these rare, rare cases, you know, things that somebody's gonna see once in a lifetime um, in practice and that, and we spend all this time on this single zebra case as opposed to the things that they're gonna be doing over and over and over again. Um, and that, that really we should be spending our, our effort on. Um, and then sometimes the personal, the social, kind of the whole person can get missed in a case. Um, and it can just be this very like medical, scientific, diagnostic process as opposed to, well, what about this person's social circumstance that might impact their care? Um, and these can take a lot of time. Um, they are not fast necessarily. Uh, there are ways to, I think, speed them up, but they sometimes can just be really, really long. Um, in terms of virtual consideration, case-based learning, it seems like it really goes well um, in the virtual classroom. It can be harder to engage students, like the students who are quiet and don't, don't engage. It can be hard to engage everybody. Um, it can be harder to get individuals to take cases people keep their cameras off, getting people to turn their cameras on and really engage in the process. Um, and if it is a large group, it can be hard to see who is there in a large group. We talked about breaking people into breakout rooms though, into smaller groups and then coming back to the larger group. Um, and that the utilization of breakout rooms to create those smaller groups to force everybody's engagement um, can be really effective like what we just did. <laughs> um, so that's case-based learning. Um, and then for problem-based learning, it's somewhat similar um, with a few key dis differences. Um, problem-based learning is defined as students who sort of learn about a subject and then they work in groups to solve a problem. Um, an example being they might piece a case together as a group, dividing up the assignments and splitting up responsibilities. Um, specifically in the description and definitions of problem-based learning, it talked a lot about um, def definition of roles and, um, and the group process. Um, and so, so that may be part of just, besides just handing somebody a case or a problem, it really is kind of focused on identifying the roles in, of each individual. And so I, one pro we identified is it's really collaborative. Um, it kind of forces group pro that group process and individuals don't tend to fall through, you know, fall into the background as easily. Um, they, some pros, they, they have to either have or go and obtain information, the ne information needed to solve a problem. So there's, a, again, a focus on um, going out and finding the information. Um, 
an application of content and information literacy, again, like able to find information and find it quickly. Cons is again, it looks like it, that would take some time. Just even the group process is gonna take some time. It may be hard to come up with good problems that are achievable in the time frame allotted. Um, in terms of virtual considerations, they were the same, we thought with the case-based learning, um, kind of the same cons of a virtual, you know, uh, virtual learning. And then also the same pros, like you could, you know, send people into breakout rooms um, into a smaller group to facilitate this. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, does anyone have any questions for this group about CBL versus PBL? And if anybody has a better way of defining, like delineating the two, have at it. It, it is so, it, it's interesting that you bring that up. And actually Mike and I had a quite a long discussion about this. It's quite confusing. And I find PBL actually really hard to design. And I think exactly like you said, PBL requires the students to be a lot more self-guided. And they actually, I think in like the purest version of PBL, they come up with their own learning objectives. So it really takes a lot of pre-planning. It's not just like, this is a case, these are the questions I want you to answer, you know, work together as a group, that's CBL. But PBL really requires, I think, a lot of pre-planning in terms of thinking about like, okay, how do we make sure everybody comes up with similar learning objectives and problems they're gonna, you know, how do we make sure that they get on the same page at the end? So I, I know a lot of med schools employ it and I think sometimes it's a combination of CBL and PBL, but I think like a pure version of PBL is a lot more, challenging to design like you you were saying compared to a cbl well and funny enough um i think it was beth in our group said last the only time i remember ever doing this was medical school 20 years ago so <laughs> yep. i think you're right it's seen in medical school and then we don't tend to use it with our trainees after that so yeah and it's something that i think is better for a larger curriculum like i think of pbl as something that's more longitudinal and those groups come staying in the same group versus like if you're just doing like a one-hour teaching session potentially a case-based learning will work a little bit better um, for a limited amount of time. Awesome, thank you so much, guys. All right, so group three um, was role play. And I know a lot of people have very strong feelings about role play. <laughs> we'll call role play slash simulation because it's essentially the same. So group three, do you wanna chat about role play with everybody? Okay, sorry about that. All right, so we talked about role play. I mean, this is where somebody takes on the role, different roles in, in any given scenario. The interest, we kept most of our chats around uh, the roles being each played by a student, but we also talked about student uh, uh, with playing, um, role playing with maybe an actor or a, uh, uh, the instructor. And I'll tell you why we kind of brought that up later. It does talk about in the description of role play as it can also be role playing in a group. Um, I was less clear. We were, we didn't really get to discussing that because I've never done those. Um, so important pieces about the role play is there really needs to be clear objectives. Like what are you trying to get the students to take away from this experience? Um, because so we're trying to minimize the cons of role play, which can be that students don't take it seriously, that they have a difficult time assuming a role that they don't really understand if they've never seen, uh, for example, a patient um, act in this way, then it's hard for them to assume the role of that, which makes the, the role play less useful. Um, but we talked about clear objectives, uh, having a script um, and a if you're going to have students assessing each other, if you're going to be assessing the students, you need to have very clear uh, what aspects of the role play that you are um, grading. In other words, you can't just say, did the student do a good or a jo bad job of the role play? It needs to be very guided uh, about uh, what was this, what was the patients, I'm sorry, in this scenario, I'm describing a patient, a student interacting with patients. So what was the patient's interact, uh, facial expression as a result of this thing that they, that the student said? You know, so you wanna make sure that you're really guiding the students in the discussion after the role play, because that's really what the, the idea of the role play is, short, quick scenario, they do it, you have a discussion. 
And then if you're um, having students evaluate each other, uh, being clear about what specifically the students are looking for uh, within the role play. So you can also do a role play between, you know, having the students just observe, um, but it's better if they are participating on some level. So um, uh, let's see. So the pros of using role play can bring out the feeling. So this can be really kind of reflective practice. We talked about um, role playing a disgruntled patient uh, in a scenario and how the, the student goes in and has an interaction and the person bites them. Not literally, but you know what I mean, right? And then you kind of talk about Oh, the students got to respond to that and change their approach in order to sort of de-escalate that scenario. So it's a great opportunity to practice those kinds of um, difficult situations before a student is thrown into something like that, like in a, in a clinical. But we, we uh, ours was mostly around clinical practice, preparing for clinical practice. Um, so it also, you know, practicing communication skills, some of the cons are the actor has to really sell the character. So we talked about using a script, but also like the emotional responses to things like to really get the student um, to get the depth of what you're trying to get them to understand. Um, so they can be, you know, like getting students to take it seriously, not um, just kind of phoning it in uh, can be a little bit of a challenge. So um, so the virtual considerations, we, we kind of thought they are pretty similar to how you would do them in a classroom, um, particularly because if you're having just two people act out the roles, then you can really have, say the, the focus is on how the student is reacting in the scenario. So you can pin like the student's um, video too, so that the, the rest of the students are observing the student's reaction or you have it just focused on the, the patient in the scenario or something like that. I couldn't I couldn't remember if in Zoom you could pin both of two two videos. Um, and that's kind of the gist of what we talked about. Uh, oh we did mention something about role playing. Uh, I forgot my other um, partner's name, but uh, we did talk about the cultural implications and she has done training using role play uh, with midwives, midwife trainees who are non-literate, right? So they're, they're in a culture where everything is verbal and that's a great way to teach in those kinds of scenarios. And, and you might see that with learners who have more difficulty taking information from a written page or, or some things like that. But uh, it'd be important when you're setting up role plays to, and you might even think about setting up role plays around cultural issues or something like that. So there's a huge range of what you can um, accomplish with a role play. Awesome, thank you so much. I really like what you said about like, you really have to have a clear guidance in the beginning. And I think as I've gone through my like experience as a learner and a teacher, I think I've appreciated the power of role play in you know learning concepts and really retaining information. But I think that's definitely one of the key elements. I kind of like it from the terms of setting up a safe failure situation, yep. right? Where you like intentionally set up something where the student's gonna do something and they crash a little bit, mm -hmm. right? but then they recover from that and that that internal problem solving happens like right there. Yeah. Neat. A hundred percent, which is why I think like in my mind, I think everyone thinks about role play and simulations a little bit differently, but I think they're, you know, they're really on the same spectrum and it's all getting at like retrieval practice, you know, same with CBL too. We're really trying to get the learners to retrieve something that they've learned or they're trying to learn and really practice it in a safe situation. Um, does ha anybody have any questions for this group about role play? Okay, awesome. So we'll go to group four. Group four has a more, I think team-based learning is quite challenging. Um, and it's taken me a while to fully understand exactly what it is and how to implement it. Team four, do you wanna chat with everyone a little bit about TBL? Awesome. 
I can do it. Um, so we use sticky notes instead <laughs> of text for starters. And um, so basically what we understand that team-based learning is, is um, the system in which you, you assign some reading material or something you know that the students need to prepare on. And please, the rest of the team, correct me <laughs> if I'm saying something that we don't agree on. And then um, you have the cycles in, in the beginning, you just do like a, a set in the beginning of the class, you do like a test to assess knowledge. And then you have all this sharing with class exercise about how that knowledge was, you know, resolved in the tests or in exercises that you give. And what we saw is like, if we really come up with an example more than, because we saw a video with an example. So I think that we were too fixated in that video with that example, but basically it's that. It's like you just give them some material to get ready. And then in class, you start with this assessment. And this is the cycle that you keep going in every class. And the groups need to be fixed for the whole class. So what, we detect as a good thing about it, the pros is like the students need to prepare before so you can use the time to actually explore other things and not just, you know, giving things. Uh, probably people have time to prepare and, you know, it's like a deeper thinking about it because then you revisit ideas and it's just like the first time that they're hearing about it. But I think that a lot of us focus on some of the cons, like um, that is, for instance, in my case, particularly, I have nine students and it would be really hard for me because there was like this kind of like competition going on between the teams, like how I separate them, what do I do? I do just four by five, and then it's just the two of them, or that we felt like you have this, um, you need to have like this group in which everybody's more or less in the same level, and that might have hard to achieve. Like, so what do we do? You put like, if you have a disbalance thing, you put like people who are really good together, and, and then those always like can create that. Um, and then for build right considerations, um, we thought that when we saw, especially when we saw the video, this seems like there is an atmosphere in the classroom that you need to create, like this idea, you know, of everybody interacting and then the competition about this, the problem learning, sharing, and we're not sure how that will work in Zoom. Um, and also somebody brought up a good point that was that it seems like this will work in this way in which you have like bursts of activities in certain groups and we're not, what maybe the rest of the groups are not. So it might be hard to sustain this in everybody all the time. Like in the video, look really nice, but we're not sure how that will work in the real life. And I think that was it. I'm not sure if somebody else in the group wants to add something else that I missed. No, this is great. I think you touched on all the challenges of TBL. I think it is an excellent tool. Um, and I, you know, I, I think it works really well with the flip classroom model because you have pre-class work and you actually have a quiz in the beginning to make sure that everybody understands, you know, all the concepts. Like if you're thinking about the Bloom's taxonomy, you're hitting that bottom pyramid with your flip classroom model, you know, with the pre-class stuff. And then you can really hit up higher on the pyramid with, you know, the team-based learning aspect where we, they're solving problems. But again, I think this one's really works really well for curriculums. And I think it's going to take some finagling for like a Zoom session, but I think a really useful active learning strategy. I don't know if anyone's had experience using it on Zoom or want to share challenges with TBL. I'd say we had a very limited experience with it, but uh, the biggest struggle for me is always been uh, ensuring that all the participants actually did the pre-reading or the pre uh, the preparation. Because if if you start to lose big chunks of them, uh, then it just defers to the couple of people who always prepare. Um, so that, that's been the biggest challenge is, is ensuring that the, the group as a whole is prepared mm -hmm. in advance. Then it, if so, then it, it is really cool and works really well. Yeah, that's a really great point. Thank you for sharing that. Okay, all right, last group. Um, group five is the jigsaw. Okay, group five, do you wanna share with everyone about your active learning strategy? I can talk about it. Um, so I'd never heard of jigsaw before, but I, after learning about it, I realized that um, this 
thing that you're doing here, Cheryl, is sort of a modified jigsaw <laughs> where we kind of divide up the work and then present back to the main group. The example that they gave us online was you kind of have two groups and you have like your core group and then you divide up the topics. Like say we had these five things, we divide them up within that group and then we meet with the second group where we each had the same topic to learn about. And then you go back to your first group and teach everybody about it. Um, so I think a pro is that you get that kind of the see one, do one, teach one where you're, you're teaching it back to the group and learning by that. Um, I think a con is you have to kind of pick your topics correctly such that like you could learn about it in a finite amount of time, but have it be complex enough that there might be some discussion with that expert group and kind of learning from the other, uh, the other people that have learned about it in expert group. Um, and then with Zoom, uh, I think this is probably why the modified jigsaw is, is more common. So I've been to a lot of conferences where we do things on Zoom like this, but it's kind of hard to break back into to have like two breakout groups that you split up into. And so kind of the teach back to the to the big group, um, I think is way more common to do on Zoom just because it's a lot easier logistically. Um, but the, the breakout groups works really well. Um, so that's kind of the broad overview, I think. Um, Awesome. Thanks, Casey. Yeah, this is a little bit of a modified jigsaw. I think real true jigsaw is a little bit hard to accomplish, especially on Zoom. Um, but I think peer teaching is a very powerful tool, um, especially for like younger learners too. Um, so I really like using it. Does anyone have questions for this group about jigsaw or your experience with it? Okay, awesome. So thank you all the groups. You guys did such a great job um, teaching everyone about these strategies. And again, you know, I again, this is an introduction to active learning and a lot of these I think takes practice and just trial and error. Um, and I, but I really love all the discussions and I wrote down a lot of really interesting things that you guys shared. So I think for the next part, um, what I would like you guys to do now that we've had we talked about kind of these, trying to open up my browser. Oh, perfect. Um, now that you guys shared, hold on one second. We talked about all these learning strategies. I want you guys to think about based on what you just learned, um, and this is helpful for me, what questions do you still have about the active learning strategies you just learned about? And go ahead and go to menti.com on your phone is probably the easiest. Um, and let me see if I can. And go ahead, just enter. And this is my version of a muddiest point to see what questions you just have about what you just learned. And this will help me, I think will help us in our future sessions too, to think about questions that we may want to address during the session. I think that's a great question. Is the complex methods the Zoom format? Yeah, I think that's a really good one. Comprehension levels on the topic. Could consider exit slips as a way, like the pause procedure. <laughs> Menti, it, it, we have a subscription through our uh, pediatrics department. Um, Pamela Carpenter purchased it and I can definitely set you up with her if you're interested. So just feel free to, free to email me if you're wondering more about Mentimeter. I, I will say there are a lot of other tools that you can use. Um, Poll Everywhere is one, Kahoot, I think it's free. My med school definitely used team-based and problem-based learning, um, but that's a really great question. I think a lot of med schools are um, going towards more TBL and PBL based models. It's great for retrieval practice. These are great questions. Interactive, yeah. Okay, thanks guys. These are great cost strategies that implement different methods, specific groups, yep. I think that's a great question. So like learner differentiation, um, thinking about how you target different learners. And I think the pros of a collaborative learning is that you can have your higher, you know, you can have fellows with students and they can help each other. 
the cons being, you know, you don't want the higher level students to kind of take over. So I think there are benefits for that. That's a really good question. Awesome. Great. Thanks. Thanks for sharing these guys. Um, so I think we're not surprisingly running out of time. <clears throat> so what I'm going to do, I think let's do this. <laughs> I don't think we'll have time, unfortunately, and I apologize for actually having you guys practice incorporating it. But would one or two of you guys mind just sharing if there was anything from the learning strategies that you think you might try out in one of your current curriculums or teaching sessions that you're working on? Oh, go ahead, Jess. I'll share. So currently we do uh, lectures online, like we're using sort of a flipped classroom model. So we lecture online and then we meet in person to do laboratory and hands-on, I mean, active learning type things. So every morning I sort of review and ask if there are questions and things like that. But I think I could, I could incorporate some of these type activities such as reflection or word cut or something like that to determine where our level of comprehension is because uh, these are um, brand new first year master students. So a lot of these concepts are, are really new to them. So I could find a better way of actively figuring out where their comprehension level is before we go into the hands-on activities of these. So uh, perhaps we don't have to do it every day, but um, to get you know, a level of comprehension, like a, a permission slip to class or an exit slip or just some way of doing it other than any questions because they all get a case of the Mondays every day sometimes. So <laughs> there's my idea. I love it. I think that's a great way to incorporate pause procedures. And I think in my own teaching too, I've been wanting to see how I can incorporate more formative assessments, you know, mm -hmm. as opposed to waiting till the end, um, especially if students are not comfortable sharing it openly. So I think that's awesome. That's great. Does anyone else want to share something they might want to try? Um, I think I'll start using breakout rooms, um, you know, for the case-based learning. Um, that's a big component of what we do in radiology, but it really only kind of benefits one person most of the time to take the case. And so putting people in breakout rooms was a great idea that was brought up. Awesome. Thanks for sharing that. Anyone else? I'm thinking about doing some reflection at the beginning of my class. I require students to do the reading prior before, prior to coming to class. And I'm thinking of just having a Jamboard open as students enter and having them post like, what are they hoping to have clarification on? Or what, what are they hoping to gain from that session? It might direct my lecture or time, like where to spend time. I love that idea. I think that's great. And like, as you all know, as educators, time is money and we're always short on time. So I think especially with Zoom, you lose so much time. So, you know, at the beginning, at the end. So any way you can incorporate, you know, things into like as people are entering, as people are leaving, I think is really useful. So that's great. Anybody else? Awesome, guys. Thank you so much. So I think I have a couple more slides, but we will, I think what we'll do is we'll skip the, the last two. Um, actually, maybe we'll just do one more. I try not to, I will say this is the, this is the pro, this is the con of the pause procedure is that it can get a little bit monotonous, but I'll just do one last one is if everyone can get on mentee and just do type something that you learned today that you think will incorporate into your teaching practice. So that is the con of pause procedure. And I do recognize the irony of using this right now. <laughs> but thanks for bearing with me. Awesome, guys. So I think there's going to be a bunch of evaluations sent out. And you can feel free to copy and paste what you write in this evaluation that I'm going to send out right now. And I apologize. I work. I'm an emergency medicine physician. So we like instant feedback. So I'm going to ask you all to um, fill out a very, very short evaluation. And there's probably going to be some overlapping questions between this one and the one that you'll fill out. Let's get this one. Um, here. So just feel free to take a screenshot if you want to just like copy and paste this one into um, the academy is going to send another 
evaluation out as well. Um, that's going to be like for our workshop and then a full one. So, <laughs> but thanks for giving some immediate feedback. Um, we hope that this session was useful and I have learned a lot from just discussing with you guys and also listening in on the discussions. And um, I think it's nice sometimes to also talk about all the challenges that we all share, especially with Zoom teaching um, and how we can make it better for our learners. So thank you so much, guys. Um, does anyone have any other questions? <laughs> Jess? Sorry, I'm the one talking. No, you're it. totally fine. Yeah. Is Jamboard easy to figure out on Google? Very easy. So Jamboard's okay. free. And actually, if you, the only, um, the only thing to be mindful of is there's a sharing option. So you just want to make sure that when you share that link and you can select it for it to be made public. So any, basically like right now, these Jamboards, anybody on the internet can use it if I share the link. Um, so I would just try it out beforehand and make sure you change that option. Um, cause I like earlier this morning, Mike was like, I can't access this one link. And I realized I had made a new one last night and I forgot to make it public. So I think just make sure that you play around with it and that the link is, they can actually access it, but it's completely free. Okay. Uh, thank you so much. Yeah, of course. Um, and if you guys think of any other questions, feel free to shoot me an email. I'm always happy to chat about education stuff. And thank you, Rick, for moderating. And thank you, Mike, for co-facilitating this workshop. Happy to be your AV guy. You're welcome. It was nice meeting everybody. Bye.